we uh, close our round of uh, coordinators with Mr Agnew. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Minister. Uh, it won't surprise anybody in this committee to know that I'm going to start off by talking about eggs. And some of you might say, well, Mr Agnew, you've got egg on your face because you have said all along for the last 18 months that Britain would be fully compliant. And we got the bombshell ten days ago that actually about one, one and a half percent of our flock was still in battery cages. I think it's worth an explanation and to tell you what's actually happening about this. We didn't know about these because these birds were not in any voluntary scheme. So they weren't part of BEIC, they weren't part of the Lion Code. But also there was a massive congestion at the abattoirs, trying to get all these birds in just before Christmas, just before the New Year. It was logistically impossible. So our agriculture ministry have used the expression they are aggressively monitoring these 32 flocks and that's had quite an impact because in 10 days the numbers of birds in cages has more than halved. We're now down to under half a percent or something. The problem is definitely on its way out. But I am particularly interested in what's going on in the Czech Republic at the moment. At the packing stations in the Czech Republic if eggs are coming in, imported from a neighbouring country, and they are not compliant, the Czechs are sending them back across the border. Now, in Britain, our Minister of Agriculture says that this cannot be done, because it would be breaking European law. But if the Czechs can do it, I really don't see why the British can't do it. So at the next Council of Ministers meeting, perhaps you could say to Caroline Spellman and Jim Pace, look, the Czechs are doing this, and you, so you could do it, because if everybody does it, you will get these birds out, of, birds out of cages very, very quickly. And you've got six months, Minister. You could really make your presidency something, something to be remembered by witnessing you personally, the very last bird to come out of a cage. You can do it. I'm quite sure of that. Going on to the CAP reform... Uh, what we call a set-aside or the ecologically focused areas. Now, I am a farmer, and I would say my farm is pretty typical. The percentage that's got to go into these areas is 7%. 1.5% of my farm is already in hedges, the strips of land under cross-compliance that we have to leave beside them, copses, woodlands, pits, that sort of thing. That's 1.5%. Another 1.5% is in green schemes that I am already doing. So that leaves 4% of my farm, which is, in your language, 6 hectares. I've just got to stop farming. And if I was being asked to do this because there was a massive surplus of wheat in the world and in Europe, one might say, fair enough. But I'm told I've got to do this because if I do it, the, world, the weather across the world will improve. And I find that very, very difficult to believe. There is another uh, physical attribute to CAP reform, and that's this, what we are calling multi-cropping that you have to have, if your farm is not all in permanent pasture, then you must have at least three crops in certain minimum proportions. I would suggest to you that complying with this is going to hit small farmers, particularly small livestock farmers, far, far harder than the larger farmers. I explained all this yesterday, but I really feel that if you can persuade Commissioner Chillis to raise the thresholds, because that's what needs doing, away from the tiny acreage it is at the moment, up to something slightly more sensible, this would take a lot of people out of severe inconvenience. I'm expecting George Lyon to say something about eligibility, because he normally does. But as we see it, there's going to be a grey area of about 18 months, two years, where new entrants are going to be frozen out of agriculture because of the way the rules are being drawn up. And that, of course, will mitigate against young farmers, which this reform is supposed to help. So that's a few things for you to think about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Agnew. Thank you, Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I really do understand that there are so many words, because these are very important subjects. And you've all raised very important issues for us to discuss. And I'm sure that we could discuss a lot of these issues for a long time because we need to find solutions to all the problems that I've mentioned, the problems that you've mentioned. And we need to find common solutions. And I think that we need 
to realize that we are in a time of financial crisis. This means that we need to find new solutions. And I am very keen on the fact that we need to find solutions where we go forward. We go ahead. We do not need the solutions from yesterday. We need new solutions. And what are those solutions? That is what we are going to discuss. Where do we think we are heading? Where do we think the world is heading? We have to realize, and to some of you who have commented on, on a, I will make a personal statement, I think, at some point. But, but remember now, I am presidency. I am not... I'm not a Danish minister, I am a Danish minister. But even to Danes I have to tell them, don't ask me to go to Brussels and come with all different kinds of things that you want to have done for Denmark. Because we're presidency and we need to live up to that responsibility to be loyal, to, to find common ground and not to take our own small uh, uh, issues uh, to, to Brussels. Uh, of course, a couple of the voters in Denmark are not, do not agree on this, but this is my ambition to do this. So, yes, I will answer your questions about uh, Denmark, uh, um, but, but that's not where I will lay um, the most, most of my, my, uh, my words. Because we live in a globalized world, and that is what we need to uh, adjust to. We have imports, yes, but we also have exports. And a lot of our export is based on import and the other way around. So what we need to figure out is what, uh, what, is, it that, what is it that we can do that is able to survive in a global market? What is it that we can deliver? That is what we need to ask ourselves. I think and the economists in the OECD agree with me, or maybe I agree with them. I think they thought at first that the green economy has come to stay. So, we cannot compete in the world market on low salaries. But we might be able to compete in high quality, in high animal welfare, in sustainability, in innovation. So you talked about innovation, innovation, new products. That's something that we can do. And then, of course, we have to have sustain, sustainable uh, economy. It's also about having small production. Having small regional production, of course it is. But we can do both. Um, I think it is important what several of you have mentioned, that we need to implement equally in the, in the member states. Implementation, it's been dif dif different, uh, uh, on different uh, issues uh, uh, mentioned today, but I, I guess the most important issue on uh, uh, the implementation has been on the animal welfare. And uh, I really, I do agree. Uh, we have had the discussion on battery hens in the council. We have had the discussion of the upcoming uh, implementation of, of uh, uh, rearing pigs of sows uh, that will come into force 1st of January 2013. And uh, I can tell you that uh, we asked the Commission to be very tough on the member states. And uh, they told us, uh, was it this morning or yesterday afternoon, uh, that um, they actually have started infringement procedures, legal action towards 14 member states on the, uh, uh, on the battery hens uh, uh, implementation. I mean, this is fast. <laughs> this is fast. We're in January, and they have already started these legal procedures. And I think that that is due to the fact that we have citizens in Europe asking for animal welfare. We have Parliament saying we need a just implementation of this. We've got the Council saying the same things. Now we have to do it. But I also must tell you that I think one of the answers in the future is that when we make regulation that is far ahead, 20, 12 years, they've had 12 years to implement this. We do that because we don't want to stop business and farmers from one day to the other because they need to make new housing um, and rearing facilities. 
So they, we give them a longer time span in order to implement. But what we have to do in the future on animal welfare is to make stops on the way in order to make sure that the process is ongoing in the countries. Because I fully agree that it is completely unacceptable that we have farmers competing in different countries and within countries on different grounds. We need a level playing field also when it comes to animal welfare. So, I think that is a very important issue. And I also think that it's important to say that when we, have, we have, will have a conference on animal welfare, we will try to look into some of the suggestions from, from the uh, Commission on, on animal welfare indicators. Is that a new way of looking at it? Well, we shouldn't have this tough regu regulation that's very rigid and, and give some red tape and all of that. Maybe some of the issues could be dealt with. Uh, um, uh, for, for consumers to ask for it, uh, and, but also uh, within indicators and things like that. I mean, we know that it happens. I've got Danish farmers produce pigs for, for, for English uh, 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 supermarkets, and they have to have a higher welfare, animal welfare, than in Denmark. And they do it because there's an extra payment for them. It, w it could happen on, on other issues. So these are the things I would like to have a discussion about. <clears throat> and, and, and I think it was you, Ms. Garcia, who said that it should be science-based. Yes. And now maybe I should go a bit back uh, and say a little a personal thing. Look, I, I, grew, I grew up in the countryside. I, am, I started to become an agronomist. I worked uh, in the Ministry of Agriculture earlier, before I worked in the Ministry of Consumer Affairs. And then I became a, a member of Parliament and now I'm a minister. I have been working in and breathing in agriculture all my life. And I firmly believe, I firmly believe that European farmers are able to move forward. I firmly believe that European farmers will be able to contribute to our societies also in a time of crisis. And we need to help them. We need to help them not doing what they did yesterday, but doing what is demanded of them to do tomorrow. So this is just from my personal point of view. As with, with the background that I have, I believe that there is a future, but we need to help them. And sometimes I say about the, the farmers in Denmark, don't tell them I've told you, uh, but I say sometimes you have to lift them and push them a bit. Um, but actually, it helps. It does help. So when we come to the concrete, and now I'm back in the presidency, when we come to the concrete suggestions and proposals, pillar one, pillar two discussion, we will table this discussion in March. What is important to say is that I think that when we're discussing redistribution, we are not only discussing it in pillar one. We need to include pillar two, because things are attached. Um, and uh, that, is, that is one of the discussions I think will be important. And then there is also the discussion on the greening, because I can hear a lot of people saying that there's a problem with the greening in Pillar 1. Uh, um, I think that this is one proposal. A proposal could also be that we extend the menu of greening in Pillar 1 so that there will be more possibilities of at, uh, attaining the greening part. This could be I mean, what is diffi difficult here? EU 27. What is difficult is finding the same greening elements for 27 countries with different soils, different traditions, different climates, different everything, different languages. <laughs> I mean, everything is different and we are still together. So what we need to do is find common ground. So maybe we need more possibilities of greening so that we have a menu you can choose from. What is important for me as a presidency is it must not distort competition. It must not distort competition. That is very important. So this is some of the discussions that we could have. 
We can have a discussion about the distribution between member states, as, as I said earlier. And some of you have also uh, honorable members talking about the internal distribution in each country. But I have to tell you that this, this is a very difficult question. Because this is decided by the member states. In the past. Back in history. Each member state decided that for themselves. So this is very, very difficult to go in and change. Just to tell you that this is my, um, uh, this is my expectation. I agree with you. <coughs> and Chairman agrees with me. Thank you. Now, I, I, I say it in the mic. <laughs> but it is, I mean, we need, we need to choose our battles. Some of you have told me that I'm very ambitious, and I am. But, but uh, um, you know, uh, um, we have to make sure that we choose our battles here. Uh, some honorable members mentioned uh, biodiversity. I think also that biodiversity is very important. Our heritage, our heritage it's called, I think that is crucial for us that we keep our her heritage, that we make sure that both our tradition and our values and our ways of life can continue, but also biodiversity. And that is not just because... Um, it's not just because we signed the conventions on biodiversity, but also because it is important for all of us to have this quality of life uh, that comes with a, 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 a variation in our countries and between our countries. So, this 7% of the greening, that is a problem also for some people. And one discussion could be, that could be that um, the 7% should not be per farm, but per region. That could be a possibility, because then you could take out areas that would sum up the 7% in greater areas and create biodiversity there. So it's not that I'm saying that, uh, that all of Ireland goes out of production and then we produ produce everything in Germany. It should be regional, uh, smaller regions than that. <laughs> But, but I could see it uh, for a tiny country like Denmark. This could be uh, where, we, where you've got a stream. We've got lots of waters these days uh, coming down from heaven. Uh, and we've got a, a problem with, uh, with climate changes. We could put out the water out there. Take away the farming, put out some grassing uh, cows or whatever. Um, and then... That could be the 7%, and then we could produce on good, solid, arable land that is uh, heavy and that is capable of producing. So that's what I'm saying. This is a suggestion. This is one way we could discuss this in order to find different ways of, of picking out the, the proposal from the Commission and saying, how can we make this doable? Um, how can we uh, end these discussions? How it all will end, this was just a, 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 a topic for discussion, how it all will end. I don't know, but I can promise you that I will do my very, very best to find common solutions and find solutions for the future and keep on the dialogue with you because I said it in the introduction, I'll say it again. We have not just a historic possibility here. We have an historic obligation to find common ground on the agricultural reform. We have to do it and we want to do it. So let's get to work working Europe.